Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Like everybody's sitting over there, I guess you're trying to sit close to the door in case you need to get away, right? <laughs> What's going on? So, welcome back to our third in the series of lectures entitled The History of Western Thought, Why We Think the Way We Do. Each week now, because some of this stuff is tough, I'll admit it, um, and so I want to review things as we go along and, and try to give you the flow. You'll remember that the whole theme of our lecture series here is that much of what we take for granted in terms of our worldview, in terms of how we think about things, uh, what we believe about people, about science, about everything else, much of that which we assume is simply common sense or is simply rational, anybody who's got a brain is going to agree with us on these things, in fact they were invented by somebody at some point, in fact an accumulation of different people. If you missed the previous lectures, this is where you can see the videos, see the camera, we videotape these. Uh, also, the PowerPoint presentations are there in case you want to go back and look at the PowerPoints or you print them out. All of that's available to you with no cost. It's at our website, litchapala.org, which stands for Lakeside Institute of Theology. There are several different series of lectures, like the last series I did on world religions is on there. Uh, for some reason, we've gotten a special lot of attention, because this stuff is on YouTube as well, about the Hindu Lecture. I've had a half a dozen different Hindu people write me about that they like the lecture of Hinduism. So if you're interested in those, or Islam, or any of those other world religions, or any of the ancient Near East lectures that I've done, they're all on there. Plus, over 400 hours of lectures from our Institute of Theology, including philosophical theology, systematic theology, apologetics, Bible courses of all kinds, so that's all there if you care for it. It's all free of charge, just help yourselves. But these particularly will be on there. When you go on the LITchabala.org, there's a, a bar of tabs across the top. The one that says eight-week lectures is where you'll find this and also the uh, World Religions Lecture. Okay? Well, let's jump into it a little bit. This is our schedule for the lecture series. We started out, and we'll talk about these a little bit in a minute, with our introduction and uh, what, we, what I call faith is the first chapter. And the reason is because... The early people here came from the, the age that's called the Age of Faith. Um, particularly Plato and Aristotle, that was not faith in terms of any sort of Christianized faith because they came before Christianity, but they were the, uh, the foundation, two of the most important, or two, the two most important philosophers in ancient Greece, and they laid the foundations for much of what we did later. And then St. Augustine in the 4th and early 5th century, and then Aquinas in the 13th century. Last, um, the last week we talked about the age of reason, and we particularly were looking at René Descartes, John Locke, and David Hume, and I'm going to give you a, a brief thing on them again. Today we're going to talk about, perhaps, uh, he is the most important philosopher in Western, modern Western philosophy, and that is Immanuel Kant. He ranks up there with Plato in terms of significance in affecting Western thought and the way we understand things. And also we're going to talk about Friedrich Schleiermacher, I make a lot of fun of his name. Both of these were Germans. This, we get into the period here, where we're getting a lot of German influence. Uh, in fact, Kant, Schleiermacher, and then the following week when we talk about process, Hegel and Marx were all German. And so I, I'm skipping a lot of the German philosophers because there's only so much German philosophy you can take at one time. Uh, do we have any Germans in the crowd? Bob, yeah. Bob Klinke was always giving me trouble when I said things like that when he took the Institute of Lessons. But uh, yeah, we'll, you'll find out why I say that when we get to Schleiermacher. Um, so, later on we will talk about process, Hegel, Marx, Darwin, and Whitehead, uh, Alfred North Whitehead, process theologian. Then, on uh, September 9th, we will not meet because Carolyn and I will be in Wisconsin for my father-in-law's 104th birthday celebration. Uh, we, we have to go because... 104, and I, I keep saying the way he's going right now, we won't have him for more than 10 or 15 more years. So we, we need to see him when we can, so we're going for that. On the 16th, we will be back, and uh, the theme will be Will. We will talk about Nicola Machiavelli, if you know anything about Machiavelli or Machiavellian politics, um, William James, and Friedrich Nietzsche. Um, then, September 23rd, we'll talk about meaning and meaninglessness, Ludwig Wittgenstein, a group, none of whom survived. There are no living logical positivists, but they had an effect during the time. And then Jacques Derrida, the founder of deconstruction philosophy, which is 
the postmodern philosophy, and if you don't know anything about that, we'll get into it. It, it has affected everything. As I said last week, if you, if you know what the museum in Bilbao in Spain looks like, or if you know what the EMP project building in Seattle looks like, the fact there's no square corners, it looks like, the, the, in Seattle, it looks like colored aluminum foil has been wadded up. Those are a direct manifestation in architecture of deconstruction philosophy. And it's affected a lot of things, literature, etc. We'll get into that. So, the principle we've been working on is that there have been, since the time of the Greek philosophers, two major ways of seeing reality, or seeing uh, our experience, our worldview, if you will. And those we call idealism and materialism. Idealism, basically, and there, there are shades of this, we'll talk today about Kant, who was a little bit in the middle, um, but idealism it is the belief that reality fundamentally exists internal to the human mind or the human spirit. In other words, it's not dependent upon the external world, it's something that happens inside. Plato believed that the highest form of reality were the ideals that existed in the mind of God somewhere, um, and that those ideals, for instance, there was an ideal chair, and every other chair that's in the physical world was simply a representation of that ideal, but the ideal was more real than the physical manifestations of it. The other side are materialists. Materialists believe that it is the physical world that manifests reality, that it is what you see in real life, the things you can touch, that with your senses, you can touch, smell, taste see, feel, that those are the things that create reality. And most philosophers have fallen either in one camp or the other. Uh, Aristotle, who was a student of Plato's, was very much the materialist. And we talk about Plato being the, the mathematician poet. Aristotle was the scientist philosopher. Even though he was a student of Plato, he disagreed with him on this stuff. We followed down the first of the great Christian scholars, who was very much uh, Platonic, or a follower of Plato, was St. Augustine in the 4th century, very modern. You can read Augustine today in English translation, and you would swear somebody wrote it last week. Um, he, he was witty. He, he wrote the world's first autobiography, The Confessions. And he really feels like the truth is internal before it's external. He said, for instance, faith precedes reason. I believe so that I might understand. In other words, I make a decision internally so that I then might look at the world and understand what's going on. It starts inside, so he was an idealist. Thomas Aquinas, who came along 900 years later, is the uh, a great philosopher theologian. Both of these are philosopher theologians. Aquinas turned that around, and he was very much a materialist. He said, reason precedes faith. I understand, you know, whereas Augustine said, I believe so that I might understand, Aquinas insisted, I understand so that I might believe. He said, you perceive the physical world, you reason about that, and then you come to internal decisions about it. But you start with the physical world. You see the differences. Interestingly enough, St. Augustine is the primary ancient philosopher of Protestantism. Aquinas is the officially recognized authority on Catholic doctrine. So they divide up that way. We then looked at René Descartes, the French philosopher, and it's at this point, he was very much a, a, an idealist. He also introduced a, a kind of skepticism, a rationalism, a subjectivism. What do those words mean? Well, skepticism means, uh, we say that about Descartes because he started out saying, what can I know for sure? Versus what do I have to doubt? And he doubted everything. He couldn't trust the senses. He couldn't trust, you know, that he was being rational about things. And he finally boiled it down to one point. That he absolutely was sure that he knew for a fact. And that was, I think, therefore I am. The very fact I'm asking these questions means I must exist. Now, that says several things. One, the skepticism of doubting everything except that. The rationalism, you'll notice it's... I think, therefore I am. First, there's subjectivism, meaning I, the subject, I. The focus was on him, not some outside authority. There had always been the assumption before Descartes that there were external authorities that we had to at least pay attention to, whether we agreed with them completely or not. It might be the church, it might be, in the case of the Greeks, it might be the gods, it might be uh, scriptures of some kind or another. 
Descartes was the first one that says that it's up to me. I think. So it's subjective and it's also rationalistic because it's thought. He doesn't say, I feel, therefore I am. Or I, I sense, therefore I am. He's an idealist because thinking about it, rationalism, was the thing that determined what was real. Right? We then get a response to that in John Locke, who is an English, um, very much a scientist. In fact, he was a materialist and an empiricist. John Locke said that, in fact, I probably should push over to this slide. Plato, we talked about. Aristotle, Augustine, I forgot I had this slide here. Aquinas, Descartes, Locke. Locke was a materialist and an empiricist. He said that everything we know, all of what we understand about reality is entirely dependent upon what we experience in the physical world. It is the material world experienced by our senses. In fact, he's the one that created the idea that you have heard in education. It's something that's still debated. He said all people are tabula rasa, which means a blank tablet. That we don't have anything until we experience the physical world. And so all of our understanding of reality is dependent upon how we experience the physical world coming into us. And so the physical or material world is where reality is based. He was a materialist. You see these separations. And then, one of the great ones, what I said before I became a Christian, he was one of my trinity, David Hume, is a Scottish philosopher who really did introduce radical skepticism. He was a materialist, like John Locke. He said that we perceive the physical world and that that's where we get our input. He said there's two kinds of experiences. There's the experience of the physical world, and then there are ideas about them that occur later in our mind. But we start with the material world. That's why he's a materialist. But we take that stuff in, so we have both the direct sense input, and then we have what our mind does with it, the way we play with it. The example he used was the example of the unicorn. Unicorns don't exist, although I still swear I saw one in Australia. <laughs> and somebody that was with us saw it too. So, I'll tell you that story sometime. Um, uh, Hume said the unicorn is an example where we have, with our sense experience, we perceive horses and we perceive horn an horned animals. Those are both sense experiences, materialistic experiences. But then we put those two things together in our mind in the process of having ideas and we put a horn on a horse. We combine our real experience into new ideas, but it starts with our experience. Okay. If there had never been any such thing as a horse, we couldn't have created a unicorn if we had not ever seen or heard about or seen you know, images of a horse. So Hume was the great materialist, but most importantly, he introduced the most radical kind of skepticism. Hume said that we make assumptions about things based upon past experience. He uses the billiard example, what we would call pool. It's a different game than billiards pool. But if you hit a billiard ball, the, the, the cue ball, toward the object ball, and it hits it the same way every time, then the reaction of the object ball is going to be the same. It's going to go the same direction at the same speed, etc. The same cause will generate the same effect. Hume said, you don't know that. All you know is that every time in the past that happened, you could predict, you, know, you experienced the same thing. He said, you don't know, next time, logically, rationally, you don't know if next time you hit the cue ball in exactly the same way, and it hits the object ball, both of them fly straight up in the air. You have no logical proof that cause and effect is a necessary connection. In fact, Hume carried that further to say, you have no way of knowing, of being able to predict anything based on past experience. All you can do is say, this has been my habitual experience. But you can't predict anything. And so he introduced, uh, his field was, he covered a lot of different fields of philosophy, but he primarily was concerned with epistemology. Epistemology is the field of philosophy that says, how do we know? How do we perceive? How do we know? And so from David Hume's time on, now, so we're talking about for, for the last, uh, well, Hume, Hume's period, from Hume on, 350 years or so, philosophy has been held captive to epistemology, you know, like metaphysics and, and others, because when somebody would say, well, this is what we believe, you know, based upon our sense experience or based upon our a priori meaning before experience, well, our inside thought, some epistemologists following David Hume would say, well, how do you know? How do you know? How do you know? 
It was the ultimate discussion killer. And it really has held philosophy captive forever, and it is the source of much of modern skepticism. In fact, whenever you get into a situation where somebody says, well, that may be true to you, but it's not true to me, you can turn around and thank David Hume for that. Because it basically what that person is saying is, well, you may believe that's true, but you don't know that's true for me. How do you know? How do you know that's true for everybody? How do you know? This radical skepticism. And we see the fruit of that today, and it goes back to the Scottish philosopher, David Hume. Okay, you got all that? That's all review, but it's necessary for us to keep reviewing this so you see how this stuff fits together. Hopefully I haven't lost you on any of that. My job is to try to make this stuff understandable. And in fact, most of the people that we've been talking about, uh, René Descartes was a very readable writer, and you can read it in French if you want, or Latin actually. It was originally he wrote in Latin, most scholars did back then. You can read it in French, because he was French and was translated there for or in English, and it's very readable. Same thing with John Locke, who was English. He wrote very readable stuff. And David Hume, Scottish, wrote in English. Very readable. Now we get to the Germans. Not very readable. Okay, sorry, Walt, sorry. Um, the first one I want to talk about, and again, as I say up here, perhaps the most influential philosopher in the history of Western philosophy. If you had to name the most important philosophers, it would certainly be Plato and Kant, Immanuel Kant, German. Um, maybe Aristotle would be in that, you know, that uh, three, three group, but um, <coughs> Kant lived in Konigsberg, East Prussia, which is now in Russia. It's now uh, Kalinin, uh, Kaliningrad, 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 in Russia, but it used to be part of Eastern Prussia, so he was considered German, uh, and he spoke German. Uh, Kant, very uh, fascinating individual. He never traveled more than one day away from his hometown ever. There was a school there. He was a lecturer and then a professor of logic at the school. Um, he apparently was very social. He, he liked the the. Relationships with people, he liked the he liked the company of women, although he never married. And yet he was so methodical about everything. They said that he would take a walk every day at the same time, and people in town would set their watches based upon when they saw Immanuel Kant walking through town. Now he was a philosophy student when he wrote his first uh, papers in philosophy. Nobody really paid much attention, which was very frustrating for him. His first great work pretty much died on the vine, and he did a summary of it. But later on, he read the writings of David Hume, who was 13, I think 13 years older, and so he wrote before uh, his Kant did. And Kant said that Hume's writing, his radical skepticism especially, and I'm quoting Kant here, awakened me from my philosophical slumber. Hume's writing caused a response in Kant that led to so much of his writing. Now, he wrote in virtually every area of philosophy. No longer do we have a case where, earlier on, like with Locke and Descartes and others, they were scientists, they were politicians, they were uh, historians, they were philosophers. In fact, philosophy covered pretty much everything back then. Science was called natural philosophy at one point. That's why you still get a PhD in the sciences. You get a doctor of philosophy in sciences. Uh, but Kant comes along and he focuses on philosophy, but he focuses on every branch of philosophy imaginable. And he changed our understanding of all of them. He dealt with the area of metaphysics, which is what can I know? He dealt with epistemology, which is how can I know? Remember, Kant, uh, Hume, how do you know? That's epistemology. He um, dealt with ethics, what should I do? Based upon my philosophy, how should I act? What is right? And you remember the questions, I'm going to bring these up again in a minute, the big questions. What is real? That's metaphysics. What is true? That's epistemology. And what is good? That's ethics. Those are all philosophical questions. What is real? What is true? What is good? And then Kant also got into aesthetics, which is a philosophical field. That is what is, it's, that doesn't mean like makeup and hair. Um, that's, aesthetics is the, the study of what is beauty or goodness. Philosophically speaking. Now, one thing, and you'll see this right in the middle there, 
Kant's great contribution, the thing that in all of these different areas that made him stand out above everybody else, he was still a materialist in that he believed that we did experience physical sensation. But Kant's contribution was he said the real question of reality, well, in, this, in this regard, he was sort of in the middle. He was, some people consider him idealist. I guess I would probably have to go more idealist because he said that we take in material senses, but the real issue of how we understand reality is, what, is how our minds are organized. He basically, and this is my description of it, he described the human mind as being like a series of cubby holes. And whenever we have sense experience coming in, our mind decides which cubbyhole that goes in. For instance, he said, inherent in the mind, before any sense experience, we have perceptions of time and space. And so whenever we have a sense experience, we make decisions about where that fits in terms of our, inside our brains, or inside our minds, ideas of time and space. He talked about the differences in quality and quantity. He came up with, I think it was 27 different categories that he said are how the human mind sorts and stores data. And so reality wasn't just sense experience, and it wasn't just idealism, just in our brains. It's where those two things met, how the brain processes and stores the information we take in. And he applied that principle of thinking to every branch of philosophy. And that's why he is perhaps the most influential of all Western philosophers. He changed the way everybody thought about that. Everyone after Immanuel Kant, in one way or the other, had to respond to Immanuel Kant. Because he worked for many, many years. His first significant, I mean, he wrote a big tome early, and it died. And then he did sort of an abbreviated version called the Prolegomenon that was more popular because it was easier to read. Whereas the early, earlier writers, I said, were easier to read, Kant is impossible. And you really got to know your stuff to be able to wade through Immanuel Kant. And his volumes are like 700 pages, each one of them. Uh, the only person I know that is more difficult to read than Immanuel Kant is Soren Kierkegaard. Have you ever read Soren Kierkegaard's Sickness Unto Death? If you can read the first page of Soren Kierkegaard, and he was a Christian, Christian existentialist. He really invented existentialism. If you can read the first page of Kierkegaard's Sickness Unto Death and tell me you understand it, I will give you a thousand dollars. Because I was pretty immersed in this stuff before, I, 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 and it was in a class on uh, Western philosophers, and I read Sickness Unto Death, and I must have read that first page 50 times before I had any sense of what Kierkegaard was saying. Kant is almost that bad, because he is so brilliant, and, and, he, and he's German, so... The idea of clarity is not part of really the German way of thinking about things when it comes to philosophy and literature and that sort of stuff. Uh, and I'm not being critical about that. I'm trying to identify that as a sort of a neutral historical observation. So Kant's statement that the mind is active in knowing, he sort of combined rationalism, that is the work of the mind, or idealism we've talked about, and empiricism or materialism. The two things come together in understanding reality. And he uses, this is why it's difficult, he creates his own vocabulary for things. For instance, the interior stuff, the mind stuff, he called the noumenon. Noumena is the Greek word for, for spiritual. Okay? Um, the physical stuff he called the phenomena. Like we say, well, that was a strange phenomenon, right? And so he has his own vocabulary, which is one of the reasons. But he said it's where the phenomena, the experience of the physical world, and the noumena, the way it happens, the way we receive it in our brains, where they come together is where reality is. He also did a lot with, as I said, ethics. And he, he said, ought implies can. Which means it's never true that if somebody says, well, I ought to do that, but I can't. He said that's a contradiction that's unacceptable. The very fact that we mentally can perceive something as being an ought means there is the capability of doing it. He was pretty tough on that. I'll give you, give you a quote here in a second. He also talked about the categorical imperative, that there were certain things that by their very nature we were required to do. He was very duty-oriented. Again, this is part of his German, uh, German-ness. Duty was critically important. The categorical imperatives are the things that duty demands that we do ethically in our life. 
That's why they're categorically imperative. There's no way around them. Now, long-term impact, before I give you a quote here, um, and, and I also have a pure morality is practical reason, and that morality is the point of religion. There's still a debate about whether or not Kant was an atheist. Back then, people were not quick to say they were atheists. For one reason, you'd be get arrested for it. And so, but he focused on religion, the point of religion being in order to be more moral, in order to recognize the categorical imperatives, in order to recognize our duty, we had to have a system, and that's what religion was for. But he did not focus on faith or miracles, he spoke disparagingly about those things. His long-term impact, as I said, he changed virtually every branch of philosophy, insisting that the mind is the origin of the world as we know it, because it, it's the one that decides how things get interpreted. And um, our ability to know reality apart from the mind's perceptions of it doesn't exist. It's a combination of those things. He prepared the way for existentialism, and he was the philosopher of the Enlightenment. He was during the Enlightenment where, you know, the, the belief that human, human accomplishments, human mental uh, capabilities are unlimited. They were enlightened people now. He was the philosopher of that. And the quote here, man's emergence from self-incurred maturity, I want to give you a quote. This is an easy one from Kant, from his essay on what is enlightenment. Again, he was the philosopher of the, the enlightenment era. He said, enlightenment is man's leaving his self-caused immaturity. Immaturity is the incapacity to use one's intelligence without the guidance of another. Such immaturity is self-caused if it is not caused by lack of intelligence. In other words, if you've got any intelligence, then, then you won't limit yourself. But if you're not smart enough, then that's an excuse. But by the lack of determination and courage to use one's intelligence without being guided by another, sapere aude, dare to know. Have the courage to use your own intelligence is therefore the motto of the Enlightenment. Through laziness, now again, you get the idea, he's not the most gentle in his beliefs. Through laziness and cowardice, a large part of mankind, even after nature has freed them from alien guidance, meaning any guidance from outside, gladly remain immature. It is because of laziness and cowardice that it is so easy for others to usurp the role of guardians. It is so comfortable to be a minor. If I have a book which pro provides meaning for me, in the Bible, a pastor who has conscience for me, a doctor who will judge my diet for me, and so on, that I do not need to exert myself. I do not have any need to think if I can pay, others will take over the tedious job for me. Now, he was a genius, no question about that, but he didn't have a whole lot of patience for people that weren't up to him. He went so far as to say that philosophically he was providing the equivalent of the Copernican Revolution. The Copernican Revolution was, you know, Copernicus is the one, it had actually been said by ancients before that, but Copernicus is the one in the West, said that, that all the planets in the sun didn't revolve around the earth, as the church had always insisted, because they thought we would center things, but rather that the sun is the center of our solar system, and we revolve around that. You can imagine how much that changed science, right? That was the Copernican Revolution. Kant very modestly says that he was providing the same level of revolution to philosophy that Copernicus applied to science. Okay. He was very significant. Now, you'll notice we've talked about idealism as being people who think that it's what happens in my mind. Materialists, the things that, that, that reality is what occurs outside me that I sense. And we've kind of broken it up that way. Uh, Kant was kind of in the middle because he was talking about what those two things mean. I said he was a materialist, I probably have to say he was more idealist because the primary focus is on how the mind works. Now, recognize that coming out of the Enlightenment, everything was about rationalism. Everything had to do with reason. Reason was the God. Rationalism, if you can't deal with it in, with reason, you can't deal with it. Very little room for emotion. Okay, this was the time of science more than poetry. Well, the world got tired of that pretty quick. And so, at the end of the Enlightenment, particularly in Germany, on the continent and in Germany, they, they had the Romantic Movement. It was in England as well. But particularly, there was the German Romantic School. 
that basically said, we're tired of everybody just thinking that rationalism is the only thing there is. We want to focus on other parts of what it means to be human. Very reasonable, I think. But many of them went too far. You know, they threw the baby out with the bathwater. And probably the perfect example of that, and you're going to get some of my own opinions about it, <laughs> is Friedrich Schleiermacher. Schleiermacher was first and foremost a theologian, but he was also a philosopher. Theology and philosophy most often have been in interspingled, as my wife says. Um, that they have been mixed in, because theology is just philosophy that's focused on the things of, of faith and religion and God, but it's still philosophy. In fact, there's a whole philosophy of religion is one of the major branches of philosophy, uh, especially today. Karl Barth, the, the the most important uh, theologian of the 20th century, he's the one that created neo-orthodoxy, a return to scripture and things like that. Karl Barth said that Friedrich Schleiermacher did not found a school, but an era. Schleiermacher, as a philosopher and theologian, fundamentally changed the way everybody understood religion, at least within Christianity. Now, <clears throat> Schleiermacher was part of the German Romantic movement. He became involved with a group of the salon set in Germany. They were well-off people who would get together, you know, and, and have drinks and talk about philosophy and religion and politics and all this stuff. They were the elite. And as he was a pastor early on, and as a pastor, he became part of that. He was welcomed into it. And he really fed on this stuff. He was very sharp, very smart, very quick wit. And so much of his stuff, he was writing to that audience. And it ends up with a lot of skepticism about any traditional understanding of religion. Schleiermacher rejected Aquinas' natural theology, that is, reason seeking God. Well, he was a German romantic, and the point of German romanticism was to get away from so much rationality, from so much reason, and deal with emotions. You get the, the romantic poets deal with you know, these odes to beauty and, you know, to love and to, uh, to ancient buildings and to uh, ruins and all of this romantic stuff. So it's natural as a German romantic that Schleiermacher would, would go completely against the rationalistic approach that reason seeks God. He also went away from any idea of dogma or doctrine as being authoritative. Schleiermacher insisted and this is back to the touchy-feely stuff. <clears throat> he insisted that the Bible should not be seen as God's revelation to us, but rather it is simply a record of other people's religious experience. The Bible was simply other people recording what their experience had been of the divine or of God. And we should read it that way. And he defined religious experience as the sense and taste for the infinite. Very feely kind of stuff. Not a lot of rationality in that. Now, um, I, I will say that he is the first one that completely discounted or discarded authority from outside. All right? Others had suggested it, Kant suggested it. You know, he didn't see the Bible as a book of, of uh, miracles or a source of faith, but he still gave it credibility as being an authoritative book because it helped us create a moral system that was working. Schleiermacher is really the first one, which is why he created an era. He's the father of modern liberal theology because he said that we don't read the Bible as the Word of God. It's just somebody else's religious experience, and it's interesting, and it might be helpful to us. But we have to find our own sense and taste for the infinite. Later on, he changed his definition of religious experience to be a sense of absolute dependence on God. Notice there's not a whole lot of reason in those definitions. It's all about what you feel. In fact, he went so far as to say sin is not violation of divine law. Remember, he was a theologian as well as philosopher. Sin was not a violation of divine law. It was man wanting to be free. You see why evangelical theologians like myself Look at Schleiermacher and go, Fred, 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 why are you, what are you doing? You know, he, he unplugged all of the stuff that had been part of the traditional faith. He insisted that redemption does not mean being saved from our, mean we're saved from our sins, but rather it's a regaining our sense of our dependence upon the divine. 
And Jesus, he said, was not divine. He was not the Son of God. He was just a model. He was one, as a model to us, who walked so closely to God that you could say God dwelled in him. Now, all of these things I just said that Schleiermacher said, he said them first. But there's a huge number of modern theologians, Christian theologians particularly I'm talking about, um, and especially Protestant theologians, because the Catholic Church has never allowed very much of this, but Protestant theologians, like he was, that, that say these same things now. And Schleiermacher is the one that came up with them. He's the one that put them out there. You can't count on the book as author the, the Bible is authoritative. Sin is just man wanting to be free. Redemption simply means rediscovering your sense of dependence upon the divine. And you wouldn't talk about God a lot. He was not a personified kind of God. It's also, because he was a romantic, it's about my experience. What I am experiencing. I can read the Bible as somebody else's experience, but the real point is, how does it help my experience of the divine? So, he is the one that was ultimately subjective. It's about me. It's about my experience religion, it's not really about God. He was the first Christian, major Christian theologian, and that's why he started an era that said, the issue isn't anything about God. We don't start with God, we start with me. You start with you. And that fundamentally changed a lot of what Christian religion, because we're talking about Western, again, we're talking about Western philosophy, and Western philosophy, Christianity, was and is the dominant religion. Not the only one, but it's considerably the majority one. Now, the idea of subjective religious experience, my experience, is the focus. All of this makes him, as I said, the father of modern liberal theology. He is the one that created this fundamentally different understanding about everything having to do with the Christian religion. And after him, those who were impressed by him and picked up on him are those that represent liberal, modern liberal Christian theology today. Does that make sense? This is where that started. It isn't just that these pastors, you know, so-and-so pastor or this and that pastor decided, oh, you know, this is what I think about it. Whether they know it or not, Schleiermacher came up with all that stuff. And they have inherited it, whether they know it or not. Okay? So in terms of the kind of relationships we've talked about, idealism, Believing that the most important thing is reality is internal. It is either the abstract that we understand or it is the, what's in our minds. We have Plato to St. Augustine to Rene Descartes, fed a little bit into David Hume, but then Immanuel Kant and then Friedrich Schleiermacher. You know, Schleiermacher, you see that Schleiermacher is further over to the left. He was about as far on the idealistic side as you can think of because it was all about me. What's, what's happening inside me. It's not what's happening out there. There's no, it's what's happening inside me. It's completely subjective and completely idealism. Then on the materialist side, the people who believe reality is in the physical world, we start with Aristotle and then Thomas Aquinas, the great Catholic theologian, then John Locke, the founder of empiricism and the scientific method, David Hume, and then we're going to pick up some more of these materialists later. But especially during the Enlightenment, the rise of rationalism, and then during the Romantic period, the rise of experience as the most important parts. That's where you see the idealism coming into it. And all of these things play into those questions we talked about. These are the fundamental questions of philosophy and of human life. Um, how do we know what is real is the question of metaphysics. Well, all of this, idealism versus materialism, have been efforts to decide what is real. How is reality? What is reality? And how does it exist? And then how do we know what is true? What can we trust? What do we have to doubt? How do we absorb sense impressions? And what do we do with it once it comes in? Most people have this, this sort of naive sense that we see the world out there as though we're just looking through a glass window, right? Well, one of the things you get into, especially when science begins to really take hold, um, from John Locke on, probably, through the, the Enlightenment and the Renaissance. Think about it for just a second, and you will realize that it is never the case that what I'm seeing, I'm, I'm seeing Guillermo, I'm seeing the Johansons, I'm seeing, you know, the friends there, or the, the, the clock. I'm not just looking through a plate of glass that are the lenses of my eyes, because 
what happens is light strikes those, bounces off, it comes through the lens of my eye, it hits my retina, affects the cones that determine color and depth of field, and then is transferred by the retinal nerve into my brain, and then my brain processes all that and creates what I perceive as, a, as an image. Right? Do you ever think about that? How do I know that somewhere along the way I don't have wires crossed? And, and there are cases where people do have wires crossed. That's what dyslexia is. Dyslexia is the inability to take perceptions and read them rightly because the brain reverses things. Color blindness. There, you could come up with a dozen different ways in which we can demonstrate that it's not a matter of us just like looking through a big, uh, a big picture window and seeing things out there, but rather all of this information gets processed. So how much of it is what is really out there? How much of it is the processing? How much of it is what our brain is doing, our mind is doing, etc.? These are huge questions. How do I know what is real? Because it's not, I'm, I'm not directly experiencing you guys. I'm only indirectly experiencing you as my brain processes. Right? Does that make sense now? How do we know what is true? How do I know what I'm seeing is true? Optical illusions, mirages. We have all kinds of examples of the fact that what we think we see is not true. It's not real or it's not true. How do I know it's true? And then, ultimately, what is good? What is beautiful? What is good? How do I decide that? Particularly if I'm not sure that I can trust my senses. You begin to see how these questions really do affect all of the decisions we make about how we live our lives. And frequently, our answers to these come from people who had their own views about things, and in some cases, their own agendas. Um, Friedrich Schleiermacher, brilliant guy, completely wrong, as far as I'm concerned, as a Christian theologian. You know, I'm on, I'm on the, the evangelical side of that. He's very much on the liberal side of that. So we would disagree on all those points I talked about, that his interpretation of what the Bible is, and redemption, and all of that. But, brilliant guy. So I have, to, I have to be aware of how do I decide what's true? And from whom do I take my tutelage? From whom do I decide the rules? Who tells me my rules for deciding what is good, what is true, what is real? Most people don't even realize they are accepting some of these rules. That's the point of these talks. So we've already looked at these people. Plato, idealist. Aristotle, materialist. Augustine, idealist. Aquinas, a materialist. Descartes, an idealist. Locke, a materialist empiricist. Hume, a materialist and radical skeptic. He's the one that introduced the radical skepticism. Well, how do you know? How do you know? How do you know? We then get Kant. He's a modified idealist because he focused on what the, you know, the sense experience of the material world, but then the brain develops it. So reality is dependent upon the mind and how it structures the input from material experiences. Are all of the cubby holes in your brain clear? Or are you messing some things up? Because you're not understanding things correctly. Um, Kant would say that our greatest goal is to be clear about how our mind processes things and that we don't have stuff junking it up so that our senses of time and space, quantity, quality, and all the other things that we have in our inside before any sense experience, that we're getting straight. But that's the job of the philosopher, in fact, the job of all. We then have Schleiermacher, idealist, radical subjectivism. It's about me. It's about my experience. It's not about God. Even religion, even Christianity, the dominant religion in the West then and now, is not about God. It's about me. What's good for me? How many churches have you ever been in where the sermons were all geared toward what do people want to hear? What will make them feel better? Okay. Thank you, Friedrich Schleiermacher. All truth, even religious truth, is a matter of individual experience. Okay, back to the example again. Well, that may be true for you, but it's not true for me. That may be your experience, it's not my experience. The idea that there is no such thing as objective truth. Nothing that is true, despite what people think about it. A story I've told before, the old Dick Cavett show. Remember Dick Cavett? 
Dick Cavett show in the early, uh, when Jane Fonda was still young, when she was still Hanoi Jane, she was on the Dick Cavett show with the Archbishop of Canterbury. And Jane Fonda is the earliest person I know who said, who'd say this, but she said, well, Archbishop, Jesus may be the Son of God to you, but he's not to me. All right? My experience is different than yours, and that determines what is real, what is true. Well, the Archbishop referred to an older way of thinking, which I think is still correct, when he said, well, either he is or he isn't. Something is either true or it's not at some point. But do we think about those things? Do we think about how we process that stuff? Um, and again, the, the, in that case, the Archbishop of Canterbury is reflecting one of the basic principles of logic, of rationality, one of the laws of thought. The second law of thought is the law of non-contradiction, which says, and these, these are one of the basic principles on which all reasonable thought is based. The first is the law of identity, the third is the law of the excluded middle, the second is the law of non-contradiction, which says something cannot be both true and not true at the same time and in the same way. If I say that chair is blue and you say it's not, we both may have a right to say that, but we can't both be right, not based upon the fundamental laws of logic. Are we aware of that? Whose rules are we following? They cannot be both true and not true in the same way at the same time. That's what the Archbishop of Canterbury was saying. He said, well, either it's true or not, either he was or he wasn't. Any questions about any of that? Only had two philosophers this week, so I don't have quite as much. Any questions about any of that? Or agreement, disagreement? Yes. Something which has bugged me for a long time, rational thought. But in rational thought, the, the Western world is not applicable in every culture. The Eastern cultures, and that's why I was very clear, you know, the title of this class and my comment about it, uh, is that we are dealing with Western thought and Western philosophy. Eastern theology, Eastern thought is very different. Um, they have different most of Eastern thought is based upon a pantheistic idea, a different understanding of the nature of reality, a different understanding of the nature of time. They, they tend to believe in a cyclical time rather than a, you know, a continuum, which is what Western thought tends to believe in. So yes, it is very different. Um, and that's why I didn't assume that in this, these eight lectures I could deal with Eastern and Western thought together. That's a different set. I did get into some of that in the last lecture series I did on world religions because I dealt with Eastern religions as well. And again, religion and philosophy are very closely tied together. That's more so true in the East than it is in the West, in fact. You know, we have separated those things pretty strictly, especially with the rise of science. You know, we've dealt with logical, scientific, and even philosophical things in one place and religious things in another. In the East, they don't have nearly that clear definition. So their philosophy and their religion is much more closely tied. In fact, frequently it's the same thing. Taoism, for instance, is a philosophy and a religion, as is Buddhism. Um, most Buddhists, not all, but most Buddhists would not believe in God. They don't believe there's no, a deity is not part of the Buddhist faith. Um, so, yeah, it's a very different kind of setting if you, if you look at the East. Even in Mexico, even in everyday language, even in something very basic, what I think is logic, what I think is logical, the house fell down because the that house collapsed. It's, it's not seen the same way here with simple people. Well, and that's, you raise an interesting point too, and that is the definition of terms. When I say logic, I don't mean what makes sense. I mean formal logic. You know, there is a formal structure, and it's the structure of being able to establish um, Terms of an argument and then drawing conclusions. You know, like the, the standard one is um, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. That is a syllogism, which is a formal logical argument. Aristotle is the one that really created that kind of formal. When I say the three laws of logic, I don't mean the three laws of common sense, I said I mean the, the three principles that everyone who's ever studied in that kind of formal logic says, you got to agree on this stuff or you can't go anywhere else. The law of identity, something is what it is. Well, duh. 
But if you don't start there, then you can't move forward. The law of non-contradiction, something cannot be both true and not true at the same time in the same way. And the law of the excluded middle, something either is or isn't, there is no third option. Okay? If there's not some ethereal something. So, when I say logic, I mean formal logic. And that's true in every culture except those places where, like, Zen Buddhism is the perfect example. They do not follow formal logic. What is the sound of one hand clapping? Try to make a, you know, a Aristotelian logical argument out of that one. Okay? Um, and so, and, and that's the very nature of Zen Buddhism as a particular, very small, but particular kind of Buddhism, is that they intentionally push outside the realm of any kind of logical thought. Meaning, again, when I say logical, I mean any formal process of building arguments and therefore building understanding. And again, these terms. Argument doesn't mean a disagreement. It, I mean, it doesn't mean to have bad feelings towards somebody and, and get mad. It simply means to state the, uh, the different ideas and to consider the weight of those, whether or not this, the premises, you know, the premises in the argument I gave, all men are mortal, that's a premise. And if you agree that that premise is true, then you say, what's the second premise? Socrates is a man. Okay, we'll all agree with that premise. Therefore, there's always a therefore. The conclusion to that is, if the first two premises are right, then Socrates is mortal. That's formal logic. And any issue can be presented in some form of formal logic. Unless your goal is to live outside formal logic, as in Zen Buddhism. But formal logic actually applies to most of Eastern thought as well, but they don't put much emphasis on it. Okay. They are much more um, experiential in that regard. Other questions? I know I'm getting into a lot of different things here. But the point is, know where our rules come from. What standards are we using for deciding what is real, what is true, what is good? And I didn't mean to get as much, I sort of pledged that this, even though I'm a pastor of a Christian church, and this is a Christian church, these are things that we need to consider outside of any particular religious belief, because they affect all of us, whether, whether you're religious or not. Now, Schleiermacher, well, he was a theologian and philosopher, and we had to deal with some of the things he said because most of his writing was about like, the Christian life is one, of, or the Christian faith, excuse me, is his, his primary book, um, which is 700 pages long, 750 pages long actually. Um, the, in dealing with those religious issues, he actually was setting a direction that affects even people today who are not religious, in terms of believing that. There is no objective reality, it's just what you like. It's what you experience, it's what you choose, what you prefer. Schleiermacher's writing in a religious context established that so that even people who are not religious today tend to think that way. All right? So that's why we have to get into a little of that theology there because it has affected us since then. Any other questions? Thank you for being here. Next week, we will go on and talk about one of my other favorites, at least he used to be, he's not now, Hegel, uh, GFW Hegel, and um, so we'll go from there. So next week we will, we will, I don't even remember which the topic is. This is, this by the way, again, I put at the end, if you want to look up any of the videos or any of the other lectures that we have. Thank you all for being here, and I will see you next week.